Ah, uh, Wednesday, five o'clock block. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I've been looking forward to the show for a long time. Yeah, good, Jay. Yeah, this good is to our be show here. with John David Ann about history lens, and yeah. we're talking about transformations right. today. Right. And this is really important. This is really an important right. discussion. Right. Yeah. So yeah, so we're gonna so we're wrapping up our series on political transformations. And we you know, we talked about the the first part of the the founding of the country in the 1790s, and then we talked about the 1850s and the transformations there, the, the founding of the Republican Party, right? And then we talked about the 1890s when the populist movement tried to tried its hand at transformation, tried to actually take control of the, the federal government and, and ran William Jennings Bryan, and then he lost badly in the populists. They didn't disappear, but they really declined after Bryan lost. And then, and now we're talking about the the 1920s and the 1930s, when, of course, with the, the economic crash, the Great Depression, then you have a new set of populists who say, hey, we're not doing enough. We should do this and we should do that. And so and I the think the country was different in the sense that there were millions of immigrants who had come in. Yes. In the 20 or 30 years before that. True. It, it had been repopulated. That's true. Right, right. And most of those immigrants, uh, they didn't have much of a political identity before the 1930s. Um, in the 1930s, because of what happens, they, they gain a political identity. And it's, uh, uh, you know, what you have in the 1930s is uh, this devastating situation where, uh, you know, you have 25% unemployment, 50% uh, drop in industrial production, of, you know, uh, it just uh, the, the great dust bowl in the, in the mid Midwestern and the Okies and the Yorkies that, going west. That's right. That's right. People who are so poor who are going. My, my actually, my grandfather uh, and his family, including my mom, as a little child, went from South Dakota where they had a farm and they couldn't farm it during the Dust Bowl. They put their put their you know packed up their stuff and they they drove to uh, I think it was Washington, Washington State, and they picked apples for two summers straight. All that to make a living. The country yeah. was at great risk at that time. It was an it was incredible a about whether situation. Whether it would survive, whether exactly. the political system exactly. would survive. Exactly. Exactly. Good. This is very. This is very important to understand about the 1930s. And really, when we look at the present day transformations, I don't think we're there yet in terms of a question of whether or not the country can survive economically. Uh, and uh, and so, uh, you know, in the 1930s, you have. Capitalism, which has essentially failed. I mean, all of these companies have failed. Uh, Henry Ford actually takes his production offline for, I think, from 1929 to 1932. He's not producing any automobiles. Nobody could afford them. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So, so, uh, so you have a situation, and, and, uh, and all the major industries are suffering because no one can buy anything. No one has any money. You have, so along with the 50% drop in industrial production, this is almost exactly the same percentage drop in, in uh, income. You have, you have a tremendous deflation in the economy. Uh, the economy deflates by about 50%. And that means people's incomes essentially deflate by 50%. Uh, costs also deflate some, but, but if you're not employed, if you don't have a job, it doesn't really matter, right? So... I keep thinking, and music is playing in my head while you're saying this, <laughs> and this is the music. Brother, the hills brother, are alive. Not can, that song. Brother, can you spare a dime? <laughs> right, exactly. And in a exactly. funny way, I mean, it's, it's really sad what happened. Yeah. I mean, a lot of yes. people died. No, you it's know? true. Yeah, people they had, died, they had in no the, options. died in the streets, died in, the streets in, in Detroit in the, in the winter of, and, and of 1933, lost their which was terribly and, cold, and people were being turned out of their rentals because they couldn't pay the rent. And I want to offer you a, yeah. a point about the morality of the yeah. country in okay. that period. Okay. Yeah. Brother, can you spare a dime? It's so important because what it tells you is that all of a sudden, people who didn't know each other, people from disparate locations, disparate backgrounds, cared. Right. They had no choice to no, care. No, that's true. That, that's and, true. and they yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. And no, that's so true. now the country kind of came together well, on that, some moral level. And that, that okay. fiber, those threads are still with us, I hope, today. Okay, well this, yes, and I hope so too, because that's an important point and that's a concern of mine as well, that if we become so materialistic and focused on consumption that can we actually uh, understand political change as something other than about the economy. Uh, but about you know protection of basic values, 
uh, the, the soul of the country is Joe glue, Biden. The glue that holds us together is, is, is about caring. Right, is, right, as Joe Biden says. So, so what happens in the early 1930s then, Roosevelt wins the election, okay? He wins, and, uh, he wins handily because Herbert Hoover was really not doing much of anything. Uh, and Roosevelt says, we'll do everything to try to solve this situation. The problem for Roosevelt, after two years of doing everything, is the situation is still dire. By 1935, uh, the, the, the agricultural economy has improved somewhat, but the industrial economy, not much at all. Unemployment is still above 20 percent. Uh, you still have distress. And also what you have because of this is you have the emergence of two characters, two political characters who are, they become enemies of Roosevelt. They actually support him in the election of 1932, and then they become enemies in 1933 onward. And I'm talking about Father Coughlin and Huey Long, the Kingfisher, that great politician, that great demagogue from Louisiana. Uh, so, so let's take uh, Long, okay? Uh, Long is a very interesting character, and I think we've talked about him before, but one of the things that Long does is Long actually, uh, as a young man, as a young adult, he identifies something which is so current it fits our situation today. Long in uh, the, the 1920 sends an editorial, sends a letter actually to the New Orleans Item, which is a, a newspaper. Uh, and in that uh, editorial, he talks about how uh, wealth inequality uh, is so terrible. I think he says uh, something like 65 to 75 percent of all the wealth in the country is controlled by the top one percent in, in the country. And... He was, that was a little bit of an exaggeration, but, but Huey Long cared very much about this issue of wealth inequality. Now, Long was himself a, a lawyer. He came from some money. His father was a successful farmer. So it wasn't like he was from the lower classes, but he, so he had a bad experience. He bought an oil well, and then uh, it started pumping oil, and he couldn't sell the oil. And so the business became a failure. He couldn't sell it because Standard Oil refused to buy his oil, and he had no other way to bring the oil to, to a market, to, you know, to refining and the rest of it. And so Long became resentful against these big corporations that ran Louisiana. It was personal. That's right. In some ways, like uh, some of us feel today about big corporations that we think run our lives, uh, we think about this in ways similar to Long. So, and when, we, when you look at wealth inequality, uh, 1929, about 23 percent, 23.5% of, of the wealth was controlled by the top 1%. Okay, so Long was wrong in his stats. Today, how much wealth does the top 1% control? About 22% of all the wealth in the country is controlled by the top 1%. So we're right there with the pre-New Deal Wealth in, uh, income inequality and wealth inequality. So, so th this is a really current issue. What Roosevelt does. Wait. Yes, go ahead. Huey Long. Huey Long. What ah, is a, okay. a demagogue? Okay. What do you have to do to qualify as a demagogue? And, <laughs> and what got him assassinated? He you, must want, have done... you want to qualify? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so uh, the definition of a demagogue is somebody who appeals to the basic uh, kind of emotions and prejudices of of voters, instead of telling them the facts, maybe put in a few lies or at a minimum, attack the kind of people these voters hate in their guts, right, in their emotions. So, so that's what Long did, right? He, he attacked uh, the wealthy, uh, he attacked immigrants. Now, I, I can't find any so evidence it, that it, Long was a racist, but but he was definitely, definitely ethnocentric. And that, that to Father and, and, and his, yeah, I mean, his <laughs> long doesn't say it uh, explicitly like Father Coughlin does, but he's anti-Semitic in his heart. And these, you know, these, attack, uh, these attacks on financiers and kind of the merchants of death, uh, referring to arms dealers, these are almost always references to Jewish, uh, mm -hmm. the how, Jewish How do you population. deal with, with the uh, African-Americans? Yeah, it's, I, there's, I have no evidence that, uh, that Long was actually racist in that way, although he's from Louisiana, so one would assume in that time period that you know, you're dealing in a, in a climate of segregation in, in Louisiana. So I think he probably was a racist. So, the, way, you know, yeah. I remember, the, uh, I remember the, this old slogan about him, 
Um, you can pull, fool some of the people right. all of the time and <laughs> all of the people some of the time. Right. But you can't fool right. all the people all the time. Right. And he got assassinated well, for trying to do so, that. <laughs> so Long, I mean, he fools a lot of people a lot of the time. He became, he was governor and then became elected senator. There's one point. So Long, Long was a man of the people, but he was not a man of the democratic process. Okay, so in that way, I suppose he's reminiscent some of Donald Trump who is a guy who doesn't know much about the Constitution, doesn't, would really like to make decisions by himself, doesn't really have much respect for the democratic... Democrats are like that. Yeah, the democratic <laughs> process. So Long, at one point, orders out the National Guard to surround the Capitol when they're not doing... The, the legislature's not doing his bidding. At another point, he goes to the, to the Louisiana Supreme Court and has the lieutenant governor removed... He accuses him of trying to do a coup d'etat. So oh, <laughs> politics in Louisiana, it's so, blood sport. It's you, so very you said exciting. that Long and Coughlin went against Roosevelt. They right. turned on That's him. That's right, they did. Uh, well, how did that happen and what right. was the result of it? Well, so Roosevelt, they felt like Roosevelt was too conservative in his proposals, in his solutions in the first two years. So then they come to the national scene and Roosevelt and his advisors recognize this. They say, hey, these guys... Roosevelt at one point refers to, it's, it's not Father Coughlin, but Huey Long and then General Douglas MacArthur as the two most dangerous men in America. This is long before World War II. <laughs> yeah, also. yeah, but <laughs> MacArthur's got this big head and everything. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, so Long and Coughlin, they, they developed this national platform. At one point, Huey Long has uh, 7.5 million people who belong to his this national organization called the Share Our Wealth uh, Plan. That's a lot of people. That's a in lot those of people. Days. Yes, that's the whole right. The population of the country was less than 100 million. Yeah, it's, it's a little over 100 million at that yeah. point. So this is an enormous constituency, and Roosevelt becomes frightened by this. He thinks, okay, it's very clear what what where this is going. Long is going to run for the Democratic nomination in 1936, and he could beat Roosevelt. So what Roosevelt does. Is he begins to move leftward in his politics, and I think we talked about this last time. He creates the New Deal with the Wagner Act, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 WPA, and the Social Security Act. Well, on one hand, you got to give him credit for moving, you know, changing <laughs> no, that's true. position. That's right. On the other hand, um, you got you, you have to give those guys credit for pushing him. Well, that's right. It might so, not have happened right. if they had not you pushed him. You might not like Huey Long for his demagoguery or Father Coughlin for his anti-Semitism. On the other hand, they did push. In that way, uh, their kind of their their usefulness, their utility was in pushing Roosevelt into the New Deal that you know has has really bless this nation today with all of its benefits. I mean, is it, yeah. is it true? I mean, just it's a one little yeah. tiny question. Yeah. You know, it was not all that successful through the 30s. Uh, it got really, the New Deal, oh. it got really successful when we, you know, we got into war. Well, I, I, so I, query whether, you, you know, I mean, the, the popular wisdom, the conventional wisdom is that Roosevelt saved us in that period. Yeah. Did he? Did the New Deal save us in that yes, period? Yes, I think Roosevelt saved, let's say it like this, Roosevelt saved capitalism. Okay, and prevented us from going down the route of fascism. Because if Huey Long had gotten elected, he might have been tempted by, the de by seeing what had been developing in Europe by the development of fascism in Europe and, and tried to take more power than, you know, than the Constitution allowed and, and becoming a dictator. Okay, so he, so uh, yes, Roosevelt saved capitalism. If you like capitalism, Roosevelt saved uh, capitalism in the 1930s. But he also created another country, a different country. Absolutely. He, he, he put things uh, into the mix that really profoundly changed us. Right. And I submit this, I see if you agree, yeah. that all of that, that period from the time he was first elected till the, till the war, right. was essentially serendipitously preparing us for the war. We, we came together. No, I mean, no, I mean, so, so by 1937, 38, those components of the New Deal were in place. And actually, they were quite successful. If we hadn't had a war, the works program, the WPA, was putting lots of people back. They put, what, 8 million people back to work? So, uh, so no, the, the, the New Deal was successful on its own. Now, the, the, war, uh, I, I, the war helped the economy recover completely. Sure. That, that's certainly true. Yeah. Um, and the war allowed the Roosevelt administration to put in place what we call a liberal regulatory state. Okay. So, so uh, Rose the Roosevelt administration 
then put regulations on capitalism. So what had happened in the 1920s with the stock market crash and with, you know, kind of out of, out of control capitalists wouldn't happen again. Okay, so that was a good thing. Now, many of those regulations were done away with in the period between 1980 and 2000. And so we had the Great Recession happen because we allowed capitalism to get out of control again. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. my, you know, what I'm trying to get at here is that if you're going to have a capitalist system, you need to put brackets on it. Yeah, so you need to put limits on it, regulations. So on if it. you treat this discussion... And, and, and the, one other thing, and you need to redistribute every so often because capitalism gives capital to those who already have capital. Right, it perpetuates right. That's, itself. That's yeah. right, and, it, and it, in that way it becomes quite dangerous on its own without some redistribution. Yeah. As, as an historian yes. uh, who looks at uh, transformations, right. um, certainly um, you know, what you're talking about in the 30s is a, is a, is a major transformation. Oh, in the this, is a, this is a big transformation. It's a saving yeah. grace that's kind right. of transformation. That's right. that's right. So when did it end? Right. And, and good. what followed yeah, that good, transformation? Good question, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, be a, you'd make a good historian. <laughs> All transformations end, but right. some transformations don't end so well. <laughs> right. So, so the, the, what we call the New Deal Coalition comes together in the election of 1936. It consists of workers. It consists of urbanites. It consists, consists of immigrants, African-Americans. These last two categories had mostly voted Republican before that especially African-Americans, you know, the party of Lincoln, they had voted consistently on the Republican side until Roosevelt, who offered them the New Deal wasn't a great deal, but at least it was something. It helped raise African-American hopes and, and livelihoods as well as, as white folks. So, so you have this New Deal that comes together and this coalition that comes together. And then in the 1960s, things become, things start coming apart. And uh, let me go back to something you talked about two or three shows of yeah. the reemergence of the Klan uh, around the time of Woodrow Wilson and thereafter into the right, 20s. Right, right, right. And yeah. that's when Trump's father was uh, arrested oh, as yeah, a yeah, member yeah, of right, the Klan right, right, or yeah. participating in a Klan event. Right. Um, so it sounds to me like before Roosevelt, there was a reemergence of uh, this kind of uh, white supremacy thing uh, that came, you know, in the, in the days of the carpetbaggers yeah. and reemerged. Yeah. And it was uh, on the Republican side of things. And the, uh, and the African-American community was saying, wait a minute, this isn't really our cup no, of tea? not on the Republican side, actually. So the Klan reemerges, but Klan reemerges in the Midwest, but it, had a, it has its real strength in the South, which is solidly Democrat. It's not Republican. So they left the Democratic Party? Uh, so no, no, they stay in the Democratic Party until the 1960s, when the civil rights movement becomes an issue for the Democratic Party. The, Democrat, the Democrats decide, you know, we're going to support civil rights. And that's when Southerners who, who are frightened by civil rights and uh, believe that their system, the system where everyone has their own place, right, blacks on the bottom and whites on the top, is the right system. The segregationist system is the right system. They don't want to give up any political power so what, to African Americans. What I hear you saying is that this transformation changed. There was a big switch oh, yeah. in the 1960s. It, in the 1960s. It that, wasn't just the civil rights movement, but that was, it. That was part emblematic, of it. Emblematic, yeah. That, that's and then it was Brown versus Board of Education, which is now, I mean, it's so interesting. Brown versus Board of Education is like withered. It's uh, like vestigial yeah, already. Yeah, yeah, it's, and, it's, and there are attacks on it. Believe it or not, like Roe v. Wade's, there are attacks on Brown versus Board of yeah, Education. Yeah, I mean, yes. In 1964. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yes, 1954. Sorry. Brown versus Board of Education. But that was just the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. So, so in the 1960s, you have the New Deal coalition fracturing. And this is always the issue with coalitions. We assume that a, a decent political coalition, if it's well done and there's good leadership and they've got good issues, it will last for a generation, 32 to 40 years. And that's about what the New Deal coalition lasts. And it comes apart in part because the Democratic Party embraces the civil rights movement and the South, then Southerners begin to leave the Democratic Party. It also comes with Ronald Reagan's attack on government. We, you know, we want to get the government off our backs and New Deal liberals are associated with government. They're also associated, there's Ronald Reagan right there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so, and, 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 uh, so, uh, so New Deal liberals are also associated with what we call Eastern elites. And so this kind of elitism is attacked by both 
Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan. So we've got a picture of Nixon as well. Here's Richard Nixon. Okay, that. Oh, what a wonderful pose <laughs> yeah, that is. Yeah, he's, that's true. He's, <laughs> pure Nixon. <laughs> anyway, that's Richard Nixon. And so both Nixon and Reagan attack the New Deal coalition very effectively. Really, especially Nixon with his idea of the silent majority. He's opposing this to liberals in the liberals and the student movement and the hippies in the in the Democratic Party. And he's very successful at this. And then Reagan comes in the early it was 19- time. The country was moving conservative. Well, right? it, it was, was time for that. Well, it, it moved. It, cons- it, it became more conservative in part because savvy politicians like Nixon and Reagan actually used, to people, yeah. used these issues to bring people into the Republican Party. So, yeah, it became more conservative that way. And then, of course, Ronald Reagan in 1980 wins election. And what he does is he takes lunch pail Democrats, working class Democrats, and he moves them. He gets 54 percent of working class Democrats to vote for him. Unprecedented. And this means that the New Deal is going to to fall apart because the base of the New Deal was with folks who had voted for Roosevelt because he had he had supported them, he had supported unions, he had supported putting them back to work, uh, and so the New Deal comes apart at that point. And then you have the development of this new, the rise of conservatism, and that really has- And that's uh, still today. Well, that's dominated the political system until today, actually. So what you have is, when you, when you measure liberals and conservatives, the percentage of the population liberal, percentage of the population conservative, at, at the height of conservatism uh, in the 1990s and, yeah, really 1990s, when you have Bill Clinton, who's a Democrat, but moves to the right as a Democrat, right, embraces conservative issues uh, because he, know he, he knows he can't get reelected as a liberal Democrat. So at that point, you have about 40% of the country is conservative and, and about 20% of the country is liberal. Today, about uh, 35% of the country is conservative and about 26% of the country is liberal. So we've seen a steady decline in the number of conservatives and a steady, steady increase in the number of liberals. I think probably it's uh, the Iraq war and then the Great Recession really pushes people to, to think that, hey, you know, the government has to do something about this. Maybe the government does have a role in, in, in solving these problems. And so today, actually, liberal, liberalism has actually seen this re- resurgence. It's not so bad to be called a liberal anymore. But, well, is yeah. Trump involved in that? I mean, it seems to me that Trump has done things that would that would make ordinary human being, God-fearing people more liberal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, certainly Trump has accelerated this trend towards Americans turning more towards liberal liberalism rather than conservatives. So yeah. we're and, on, yeah, go we're, ahead. We're on transformations. Yeah. We're yes, on transformations. Right, right, right. And here we are. Here and we are. I submit to you, yes, Jay. I submit to you that Trump is a either reflective or, initi- or, or creating a transformation as never before in this country, except the Civil War. Except the Civil <laughs> War. You know, because, because what we okay, have now okay. is a transformation that actually regularly, daily attacks the Constitution yeah, so, willfully. Right, right. I, I don't know that, I, I wouldn't say the transformation is such that we've never had before, uh, except the Civil War. Of course, the Civil <laughs> War is this, this moment in the history of the country. But What we do have is we have a president who is a demagogue, who has been willing to use the most unsavory issues in the most unsavory way to uh, bring people at their emotion, at their gut level into into his ranks. Okay, and and so uh, and and Trump is he has no rules, which is interesting and could mean this could mean that Trump can form a new political coalition with his ideas, right? Uh, isolationism, uh, tariffs, uh, rejection of globalization, um, what he calls America firstism, right? There was an America first movement in the 1930s, which ultimately was unsuccessful, but it was there. Has, has Trump been able to put together a new coalition which would allow that to happen? Anti-immigrant, but when at, you say a new point, coalition, when you say a new yeah, coalition, yeah. and you say essentially a new party, 
That doesn't mean it has a new label. No, no, it's, it's, that's it's right. It's actually still the Republican Party. That's right. It's just been gutted and replaced. That's right. That's and right. I think that's, that's right. isn't that what's happening? No. So, so the thing is, in order to have a viable political coalition, you have to be successful. And you have to gain a majority of the, you know, the vote. So the problem that Trump has is he's a, he's, he's a very unpleasant character. A lot of Americans are turned off by his immorality and other personal issues. Right. And his terrible attacks. And so and, and, and there are more Americans now who don't think some of these these issues that he's brought in, these very kind of uh, 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 right wing issues, not at the center of elect the electorate, but very right wing kind of uh, strident issues, uh, you know, uh, abortion and and, you know, and keeping all, you know, uh, refugees out of the country in any way possible. But isn't that really part of the, um, a, a demagogue's approach? What you do is you divide people, you yeah. create hate, no, that's you true. create racism. That's, that's true. And but, then that makes you more powerful. Yeah, but the problem is that Trump has not gotten to the point where he can accumulate enough of a coalition to actually win an election, another election, okay? He didn't have a majority. Legitimately win. Yeah, well, he didn't have a majority of votes in, 19, in 2016, right? He's going to have, I, I, I can't see a pathway to Trump winning the next election. Okay, the problem is that the, what he's put together is a coalition of the minority, of the right wing minority. And what he's done is begin to exclude a number of moderate Republicans who have to decide, okay, can I stick with Trump? No. I'm going to have to find somewhere else to vote or I'm not going to vote. And so what, what really is the opportunity in this political transformation is for a Democrat to step in, a liberal to step in and say, hey, I've got issues you could get behind and we're going to, we're going to stop Trump in his tracks. And, it, you know, the polling right now shows that if, if the election was held today, Joe Biden would win the primary and he would win the election. Wow, I was saying something. By, by 68 <clears throat> points over Trump. But, you know, and, and this is, uh, uh, <clears throat> and this is a, a page out of Churchill's book. Um, so, history professor. Yes. Studying American history, yes, and I right. really love that. Yeah, I think good. it's so important I'm that so we glad, all know Jay. about these You're Making these me happy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's really important. How can yeah. you possibly understand the present in yeah, American exactly. history? Exactly. Without knowing all the things you've been talking about over these last few months. Exactly. So uh, to take a page, a question out of Churchill's book, yeah. you know, in terms of transformations, yes. you know, from a historical point right. of view. Right. OK. Are we in terms of transformations? Are we at the end of the beginning uh, okay. or are we at the <laughs> beginning of the end of the transformation right. that right. you have identified? Right, right, right. I think we're right in the middle of it. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you know, I think Obama began this with his argument for change. And, but he didn't know how to culminate it. Honestly, he made some mistakes. He could have actually uh, been a transformative leader like Roosevelt, but he, he, he was too conventional in the way he thought about the electorate, I think. Um, and so I think we're right in the middle of it and it's not decided yet. But honestly, I think the way the trends are going, it, it favors a more liber liberal approach than uh, the previous transformation. So if you study history, and especially American history right, right. now, um, it, you know, it helps you appreciate the present. Right. But, but, right. as any historian will tell you, yes. um, in order to understand the continuum, right. you must also yes. study the present. We yes. must all, all Absolutely. of us also study Absolutely. the present. Absolutely. So, so I'm the type of historian who believes that we have to take history, the lessons of history, into the present. Okay, so there are many historians who say, no, nah, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, you should just study the past for the past. But I'm not one of those. I believe that the past offers all kinds of lessons to us in the present. And so, you know, the, one of, a couple of lessons, okay. First lesson, hang in there, okay, because uh, it's not over, right? And uh, there's, a, there's an electorate out there. We still have our democracy. Hang in there, okay. The other lesson is, be persistent. Don't give up. There are going to be some tough times in the next few years. But be persistent. Uh, stick with your goals and, and, and go for those goals. Be well organized. Uh, be willing to take risks and be persistent. 
sooner we can continue this conversation, yeah. John David Ant, yes. uh, the better I'm going to feel because we can test on whether those lessons are okay. are valid, right, <laughs> right, or are being learned. Right? Uh, yeah, that's right. John David Ant, history professor, H HPU. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome, Jay. It's history lens. Yes, right. Good to be here. <laughs>